Okay guys, so today's video is again we're looking at life in Nazi Germany and this video is really going to concentrate on the idea of propaganda and why propaganda was such an important aspect of life during uh, in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Okay, so just a quick recap on what we've looked at so far because in the last lesson we went through quite a lot okay, and we just want to make sure that we're clear on where everything is at the moment and what we're looking at. Okay, so we know that due to the Treaty of Versailles after the end of World War I that life in Germany in the 1920s is very, very difficult. It's really difficult because they're having to pay a huge amount of money back to the countries who won the First World War and it means that the economy in Germany is really struggling. And now the public obviously don't dislike this, okay? no one wants to live in a difficult life. So they are very against the government running the country at the time. And so when Hitler comes and the Nazis come along, they're able to use that kind of um, this, uh, this unhappiness to support their point of view. So Hitler and Nazis come along and they promise to change things. So they promise that actually if we, if we become the government, this life is going to be better. We're not going to allow this to continue happening. So they promise change and because of this they become the most popular part, political party in Germany. Uh, and then by 1933 Hitler becomes the chance chancellor and then gets the power to rule by decree. So ruling by decree, what we said was is that it's the power to basically be a dictator. If he wants to, if he makes a set of law gonna be a law, it's just instantly done. Okay, so Hitler gains this power. And the Nazis were hugely racist and used violence and intimidation to get rid of opposition. So if people stood up against him, people said disagree with them, they would just intimidate them, use violence and just get rid of anyone who stood in their way. Okay? So they were racist from very early stages, okay? but and they used this racism as a way of kind of getting people to agree with some of their ways of thinking. So we'll look at this in, in a different layer lesson in a bit more detail. Uh, we look at the Holocaust and things, but they use uh, diff people that they don't like, so mainly Jewish people, people of different uh, groups that they dislike as scapegoats and blame them for all of the hardships of Germany. So when we look, when we do get around looking at, you'll see that the Jewish people are blamed for pretty much anything that goes wrong in Germany is always blamed on the Jews. Uh, this is how they get people to kind of agree with them. Okay, so incredibly racist and use a lot of violence and intimidation, but they do get into power. Okay, so today what we're going to look at is the use of um, the power structures of propaganda by the Nazis and how they use these to kind of get to keep power in uh, Germany in the 1930s. Okay, so consolidating power, what do we need to know? It's important to know that they, though they were the most popular party in Germany, okay, that's why they got elected, there is still opposition. Okay, they are the most popular, but it doesn't mean that absolutely everyone agrees with them. Right? Now Hitler doesn't like opposition, the Nazis doesn't, their views don't really work with opposition. In order to develop what they want, the type of control that Hitler wants, he can't really have opposition speaking out against him. So he comes up with a norm, number of different ways to try and deal with this opposition. The first thing, and he's been using this for quite a while during his, his uh, build up to power is the use of violent organizations. So the SS and the SA, and they're both used, they're both very violent organizations they're used to intimidate people, the opponents, and intimidate anyone who stands against him um, to make sure that they're not speaking out and not disagreeing with him. And people are aware of this and they become very afraid of it. So if they even if they do think something about what the Nazis are doing and they disagree with what they you know with it, they're not going to say it because they're very intimidated. By these people. Okay, so intimidation with these violent organizations, the SAS and the SA. Okay, and it's going to change a little bit in a while, which we'll learn about in the next lesson. But the SS continues throughout the time of uh, the Nazi power to use intimidation and violence to keep control. Uh, people were encouraged to inform the authorities of any opposition. So this meant that the Nazis could find out about opposition very, very quickly and they'd be able to deal with it very, very quickly. Uh, and that's leads down to point four that if you're being very, very vocal uh, about your opposition to them, you could be then be rounded up and sent to a concentration camp. And family members and friends would tell the country about uh, people who are standing, who are saying things. Okay, so you know it could be your 
brother or your nephew or your uncle or anyone could easily be turn around and report you as someone who is standing against the Nazis. So people have to be very, very careful what they were saying all the time. And finally, the media was very, very tightly controlled. Okay, so we'll look at this mainly today. They take complete control of all media. Uh, and that means that the media can't really say anything bad against them either. Uh, and if no one's saying anything bad against you, it becomes much, much easier to keep control. Okay. And now we're not, I'm sorry, I mentioned already that they do send opposition to concentration camps. This is something that develops from very early on. Okay, Dachau, one of the concentration camps, opens in 1933. Right, but the Holocaust is a little bit from yes, so this is the building up and starting to put the structures that allow the Holocaust to happen. Right, but we're going to, you know, we're not going to be looking at that just yet. That will be coming up in a few weeks. So the main thing we're looking at today is this idea of propaganda. Okay, so we all know what propaganda is. Okay. Well, and in Germany, it's used probably to one of the most into huge success for the Nazi party. They use propaganda very, very expertly and get a lot of control because of it. And all of the, most of this comes down to this man whose picture you can see here. Uh, his name is Joseph Goebbels. Uh, and Goebbels is was given when the Nazis came to power. He was given the position of being Minister for National Enlightenment and Propaganda. And that's his title. They have a minister, and everyone knows that's a style, okay? It's very public that they're using propaganda, okay? But that is just quite normal for the time that you would have a minister for propaganda, right? So his job is to make sure that basically everyone in the country thinks that Nazis are the best party going, and uh, that there's no, that you have to support the Nazis in order to make Germany great again, and that everything that the Nazis are doing is right, and to make sure people agree with everything that they do and don't speak out against them. Now, in order to do this, it's a very extensive and complex system that needs to be set up. Right? It's a huge, huge job that, he has to, that, he, that this man does. Right? It's a huge uh, government department behind him doing this. Okay? Really, really extensive things going on. But some of the symbols we can see, some of the things going on we can see are one, the newspapers are first of all controlled. So editors are threatened, editors are given clear warnings and they're given clear rules about what they are allowed to print. And they're told that they are not allowed to print anything that's going to undermine or criticize the government of the country. If anything is seen to be made, possibly making the country weaker, then they can be held accountable for that and punished for that, for being traitors to the country. He also sends out, secondly, he does, he sends out cheap radios, okay? So we're just, you know, if you're sending out free radios to the public, this is a very uh, great technology at the time, you know, it's a brilliant thing for them to get. But the reason that they send out these cheap radios is that they're there in order for people to be able to listen to speeches by Hitler. And this means that whenever Hitler makes a speech, that the entire country is listening to him. Everyone hears a speech and he's able to meet a really, really wide audience and be really, really effective with his speech. Right. And they use symbols, okay, and obviously the most uh, famous symbol is the swastika. Right. And the symbol is really, really important. So what it does is it unites people. When people see the, see the symbol of their uh, group, they're able to then, you know, feel a connection to that, right? So he uses this idea of the swastika um, as a symbol of power, to show the power of Germany and to um, unite people and make everyone feel included. So you can see in the picture there, he's wearing a swastika on his arm uh, and that would be a way that people all over the country would then be able to wear the same symbol on their arm and they would feel, oh I'm part of the national movement, I am very much involved in all of this and I am you know, a hero for my country, I'm involved with my country. Okay, so symbols are really, really important. He builds up what's called a cult of personality, and this is uh, basically making Hitler seem like the greatest person alive. Right? Hitler is depicted as this great, amazing hero. He is referred to as the Führer, and just in a greeting, a way of saying hello to people, is just to say Heil Hitler. Right? That's very, and that's how people, when every day would see each other, would say Heil Hitler and salute. Okay, so it makes the whole country somewhat militarized. Okay, it brings in certain kind of routines that makes the country and makes everyone kind of feel part of one military group, right? And that allows Goebbels 
and the Nazis to really infiltrate life in every aspect. Okay, because now when you're listening to radio, you're listening about the Nazis. If you're speaking, you're not going to tell you anything bad about the Nazis in case someone, you know, informs upon you. You have the newspapers talking about Nazis, and every time you even say hello to someone, you're saying Heil Hitler. Okay, so you can see how propaganda is becoming part of every aspect of their lives. They also, one of the most effective things they did was they held huge rallies. Okay, the most famous of these are the Nuremberg rallies. And they held these uh, quite regularly, these big, big rallies where everyone could get together uh, and would display power of the, of the Nazis and show Germany as being this great and powerful country because look at the amount of arm, the size of their army, look at these great rallies that they're able to have. Okay, so that is just a basic run through. These are some of the main things that Goebbels kind of is in charge of. But you can see from this that propaganda is affecting all aspects of people's lives. It's everywhere. They can't, they're not going to get away from it. And if you're being shown and sent the same message over and over and over again for years and years and years, then eventually that's how you get people to agree. Okay, if you keep telling everyone every day, this Nazi party is right, to do the right thing and the most powerful and it won't be great for your lives, then of course after a long time people are just going to accept it and they're not going to speak out against it. Okay? And that's you know, the kind of uh, atmosphere that's sort of built up in Germany over this time, is that whatever the Nazis do, it must be what's right, because Hitler is the great leader, you know, of course he's going to do what's right. Uh, so if you want to find out a bit more about Goebbels, okay, there's loads and loads of information out there on the internet about him. But one good, there's a short video, a 15 minute video there, you can see the link um, up here. Uh, I'll put that in the description of the video and that is a uh, biography of Goebbels, about 15 minutes long, and it goes through him in a bit more detail. Alright, moving on though, just as a quick uh, kind of case study. In terms of propaganda, one of the uh, most successful things that they do is they bring in film as a part of propaganda. Okay, so they start to produce films that promote Nazi views. Uh, and they hire this uh, woman, they get this uh, Lenny Riefen, sorry, Lenny Riefenstahl gets involved. Um, she is a hugely talented director. She begins to make films under the instructions of the Nazis to promote Nazi viewpoints and to promote the power of the Nazis. Okay, so you can see down at the bottom there, this is a image from probably her most famous film, which is called Triumph of the Will. Uh, and this film was one of the biggest films of the time, especially uh, in terms of you know promoting Nazi propaganda, Nazi viewpoints, and promoting the Nazi party. Okay, so you can see how the, just the big swastikas in the back, there's a symbol of the Nazis. You can see how many people are there and the organization. And you see how that looks to, to Germany at the time. That makes the Nazis seem extremely powerful. Okay, it makes Germany seem extremely powerful. Okay, so that is a brief overview of some of the uh, ideas around propaganda in Nazi Germany. All right, so two tasks for the day. I want you to go to page 262 and 263 in your book. All right, there are a number of sources there. So I want you to read the sources on 262 and the big, look at the big picture on 263. And you're going to put all the questions in the orange boxes, questions on page 262, and there's another five questions on page 263.